Yeah. So anyway, uh, I'm ready when you guys are. How, how do you want to do this, Joe? Uh, well, we are assembled for uh, I get uh, an interview of Adam Rosopoulos focusing on male art and whatever else John Held uh, would like to ask him. Uh, I think I'll skip the introduction of who you are, John Held, other than a very well-known male artist and male art historian. And uh, Adam Rosopoulos is uh, a tremendously active current male art. It is uh, March 19th, 2023, and <clears throat> I will leave the rest to you guys. Okay. Uh, my name is John Held. Um, I'm the author of uh, Male Art, an Annotated Bibliography, which is published sometime in 1990-91. And today I'm going to be talking to Adam. And how did you pronounce his name? I, I pronounce it Rasopoulos. But Adam, tell me how you pronounce your last name. <laughs> Rasopoulos. But Rasopoulos. I, accept, I accept all pronunciations. I mean, it's... It, it, well, as well I expect it to get butchered. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Um, well, I mean, maybe the way to start is, um, you know, yes, just yesterday I received... Um, uh, the announcement of an exhibition in, in Poland uh, curated by uh, Anna Kloss. Uh, and it kind of pertains, I think, uh, to what we're talking about today uh, because the uh, uh, the theme of the exhibition, which is in Warsaw, Poland, uh, um, is uh, male art continuum, uh, old and new. And uh, this, I don't know, about 20 people listed um, in it, uh, including, you know, myself, who's been in it a long time, H.R. Fricker from Switzerland, another old time male artist, Ryusuke Kohn, Vittorio Baroni. But then Adam is also uh, um, uh, listed. John, um, let me stop you. Half your face is cut off now. Go ahead. Uh, okay. No, it's all right. You don't need my face. But um, yeah, so anyway, it's just kind of really interesting to see that uh, although Adam's only been, you know, doing male art now for what, four years, Adam, I think? Yeah, mid-2019. Uh, mid yeah, since 2019, um, you know, he's already ranked, uh, worked himself into the ranks of, uh, you know, some of the finest uh, male artists uh, in the world. Not that anybody's passing judgment of quality on anything or anybody. But I should mention that um, Adam and I um, uh, first met in 2019, met through the mail, that is, uh, actually through Facebook, uh, when Adam got in touch with me and uh, inquiring about some uh, postage stamps. But I think I'm going to let Adam uh, uh, discuss uh, his entry into mail art. Okay, yeah, it was, um, you know, it, it, it was completely accidental. In nature, you know, I, I've always had a love for postage stamps and, um, you know, that kind of dissipated with time unintentionally. It's just that, you know, life kind of took over, had kids and kind of fell out of the art world, um, which I was involved in heavily for a long time. I was still doing stuff myself uh, for personal reasons, but, you know, I had no intention of pursuing it anything beyond that, you know. Um, and one day for no particular reason, I was just searching on ebay and came across this stunning sheet of artist stamps by yourself john and 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 a collaboration with mike decal out of san francisco and uh for whatever reason i was drawn to them I mean, you know they were in their original envelope that i believe uh mike decal had had mailed to this woman whoever received them was part of the show she'd requested or purchased the sheet of stamps and somehow ended up back on ebay um so i ended up purchasing the ebay lot for 10 bucks and when it arrived, um, for whatever reason, I decided to try to track down you and Mike DeCal, first reaching out to you. Um, and I initially had sent out three three letters. I'd found your address, but it was your name and like three other three different addresses. So I'm pretty sure there were two other John Helds or just addresses you'd been at in prior, you know, prior life. 
and uh, put together an envelope where I recreated the stamps and I recreated the envelope itself and sent it out with just a note that said, is this John Held Jr., the mail artist? And um, to my surprise, you know, you, you, you responded to me and, 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 and received this wonderful envelope in the mail and, you know, two other people got a surprise and was probably were likely super confused on what was going on, but um, that's all right too. And, uh, and that, you know, opened the door for me. I, I was, I was, I was hooked pretty much immediately. And, you know, since then uh, you've been a mentor to me in that regards, you've opened up my door, you know, my eyes to a whole bunch of other people right away. And, um, you know, I think it was interesting. It could have been completely different had it gone a different way in that I, because you've been at it for so long, a lot of the people that I got in contact really early on were people that had been involved for a long time. So um, my, I think, you know, that, that was, would have been different otherwise. I don't know, but yeah, that's, that's ultimately how, how it started. And I didn't know about it prior to that. I had no, I had no idea what mail art was. I, I didn't, I didn't even send letters. I mean, I, I wasn't one where, you know, I was doing it, but didn't know I was doing it. I, I, I had never done anything mail art related. Um, so this was kind of a, a slap in the face of this is, you know, but it was completely suiting to to how my mind worked and how I like to make art and the reasons why I didn't pursue academic arts, you know, my, my issues with money and art, my issue with obligations and expectations that are attached to that. Um, this is void of all of that. So it was, you know, it was kind of love at first sight, I think. Yeah, um, in the introduction to uh, a brief history of something, uh, you talk about uh, your involvement with your grandfather, and um, that he uh, collected stamps and that kind of whetted your interest a little bit, you know, for this later later in life discovery that you had and everything. But it sounded like a really interesting relationship, and I know you as kind of an all around guy, you know. Who, uh, does a lot of uh, things, um, you know, jobs, uh, different positions and everything. And it seems like your grandfather was the same way. Uh, but maybe you could reiterate a little bit about that relationship. For sure. For sure. Yeah. My, my grandpa was uh, obsessed with stamps as well. And he had a true love for, you know, like I said, I, and like in the intro, I said, I mean, he was making zines and he just didn't realize he was, you know, he called them newsletters um, and they would, they would, you know, include the family news, you know, whether it was babies being born, anniversaries, they would include, you know, political stuff, which we did not see eye to eye whatsoever, but that's besides the point, you know, um, and he would, he would put these together in his spare time. And, you know, he, he was very adamant about me being, I don't know if he was adamant about me being involved with it. I just showed a lot of interest. So he was open to me participating so he would he would let me put all the postage stamps on these envelopes when they sent them out so i got to go through his little cabinet that he had that he you know organized all of his stamps with and you know i'd get he i'd get super excited about this you know and i mean i must have been this probably started when i was you know six seven years old so i was i was i was really young um and he was he worked for 3m so he was always he always had a consistent job, but he was always working on different things, you know, because he was an inventor. He was working with resins, which is interesting now, you know, that I do all this stuff with rubber stamps kind of in retrospect. Um, he worked with fibers, you know, which introduced my love to paper making. Um, but, yeah, he was a very active person who just whatever interest him, he put his hands on and tried to tackle it. But uh, for sure the the zines and the stamps were were a huge impact i mean unknowingly you know like i said i kind of forgot about that that went to the back of my mind once life just kind of caught up with me um and it wasn't you know until later on being able to reflect on that to how impactful it really was uh well you know, the the funny thing is that uh you know so you're going on and on in this introduction about your grandfather and his basement and toiling away on these projects and everything so you know i I've, I've got the uh impression that it's you know this old man you know with gray hair huddled away you know in in the basement and everything and then you you go on to say that you know he was doing zines in the 90s so i go well he's talking about his grandpa who's the same age i am and everything <laughs> ridiculous you know 
<laughs> no, you're, yeah, I, that's, a correct, that's a correct assessment, though. Gray-haired old man sitting in the basement amongst all of his stuff. And um, yeah. I'm thinking that one of my favorite stories is in that in that uh, that introduction. I talk about these three dog portraits that hung on the wall. And they were like super generic drawings. And but he was obsessed with them. I have no idea where he came where they came from. But throughout his entire life, it would constantly come up like, will you help me find out where these, you know, who this artist is? Because we couldn't quite make out the signature. And I mean, I can't I can't even I, I don't even know how many countless hours I spent scowling the Internet for these portraits. And we never ended up finding anything. And I don't think it really mattered. But it was for something. It was something he was always obsessed with for some reason. And they were super yeah. I mean, they were super boring, cheesy, like just, I mean, uh -huh. it, was, it was pretty awesome. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, at least it got you started. That's the main thing. Oh, for thing. sure. It's always good to have somebody, you know, in your life earlier who's like a little bit different from somebody else in the family and this and that. But maybe we got to backtrack a little bit, just get some uh, biographical facts now. So um, tell me where you were born and, you know, when you were born and uh, your parents and if you've moved around. So just give me some background information. For sure. I was born in 1982 in... Uh... Uh, right near Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, we weren't there very long, though. We moved to Minnesota, uh, St. Paul, actually, shortly after that. And um, you know, I, I I didn't I didn't know my real father. Uh, he was in the picture, you know, only until I was about two years old. So um, there was no no association there. My mom got remar remarried when I was pretty young, um, and we moved to Plainview, Minnesota, which is a small rural town with a population of about eighteen hundred people. I'd say maybe two thousand now. Uh, it still remain, still remains small. Um, and we were there for until I was in about third grade and, you know, pretty, pretty basic childhood. I mean, nothing exciting, nothing terrible. It was it was it was a good it was a good childhood, a good town. It was small. You know, every, everywhere you went, people knew who you were. Um, my, they got divorced and my mom got remarried shortly after. And we moved to a town that was about an hour and a half away. Still a small town, a little bit, not, not quite as small, but about 5,000 people, 4,500 4, people or so called Lake City, Minnesota. And it was an interesting town. It was right on the river. And in the summer, it would skyrocket to about 10,000 people uh, because people would come with yachts and boats and stuff like that. You know, it wasn't a real wealthy town by any means, but you get that group of people in because of the water. And it's actually, weirdly enough, is um, referred to as the birthplace of water skiing. So um, you had a lot of that. And it's part of the Mississippi River. Uh, but it was, you know, it's like it's on Lake Pepin, which just opens up into a body of water. Um, but that was a wonderful place, wonderful place to grow up. I have such fond memories um, as a kid. Uh, worked a lot of jobs when I was my dad was a, a local police officer, so he knew everybody. And I was able to get a job real young delivering newspapers and working at the restaurants. And uh, because of the small town, we were always fishing, you know, driving, riding our bikes for hours out to farmlands and fishing for trout in the rivers. Um, and this is where I really got started on, on art. I, got, I was I was pretty involved at school with doing murals and things like that. Um, I had I was definitely at odds with the principal. I remember writing multiple letters to the the local paper about how unsupportive he was, and you know I don't, it's funny reading them now. They're, they're so ridiculously petty, but um, interesting nevertheless. Uh, and it, I, you know it. Lake City was a great town, but it was a very it it wasn't open to larger ideas, or maybe it was. I just didn't see it. You know, it, it could have been. I, I hate to pinpoint it like that, but I just I had thoughts that 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 weren't parallel with with you know kind of a lot of that small town living. So um, I had a friend by the name of Alex Stevens, who to this day I kind of owe, in my opinion, everything to. Um, he introduced me to a school that was in the metro called the Perpich Center for Arts Education. And it was a school that was solely for juniors and seniors in high school. And you had to apply to get in for either visual arts, media was another area, dance, theater, and uh, uh, lit, literature. So you had to apply for one of those categories and submit two pieces. And then if you got in, um, you'd go for your junior and senior, and depending on how far away you lived, there had campus, so you would live on there, you know, when live there while the school was going on, and then go home in the summers, and I was far enough away to where I lived on campus, so um, I, I got accepted and went there for two years, and that's where I was introduced to printmaking, to papermaking, to jewelry, to melting metals, to 
I mean, it really was an incredible school. Um, and probably didn't focus enough on academics, but, you know, we had a little academics in there. Um, but, you know, I did a ton of painting, sculpture. I mean, they had huge spaces so we could do installations. It was it was really kind of anything goes. Um, and in retrospect, looking back, it uh, it was probably far too much freedom for a 16 and 17 year old. But it was it was incredible. And from there, I, I, I went on to the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. Uh, once I, you know, once I was done there and I, I went there for two years, but I never, I never finished it. It became too expensive. And, um, uh, my, my wife became pregnant and had to, you know, just kind of change things up. So I went into restaurants. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, the marriage comes and that puts uh, a crimp in, yeah. in a lot of artistic, uh, you know, endeavors and everything. I mean, that, that was a problem for me too. Uh, you know, because I was married quite young and had children young and everything. Um, but uh, unlike you, uh, you stuck it out. I, I didn't stick it out. And uh, that, that's a question I have, too, because uh, uh, it, it's hard to uh, balance family life and in, in art, art, you know, sometimes. And uh, I'm wondering how you do that. Yeah. So, I mean. Martha, Martha is my wife. Uh, she's incredible. Um, she has been she's been super supportive. I mean, she knows that art just kind of runs through my blood. It really does have a, a, a incredibly drastic effect on my mood if I'm not able to exert that energy artistically in some way. And she understands that's been very supportive of it. But, you know, it you know, when the kids were young, it was really hard. Um, but. Yeah, I'm, I, I. When I went to Perfect Center for Arts Education, I met a, a, a guy named Chris Laddick, who uh, became my best friend. I mean, we were we were attached at the hip and, and he was he was as driven as I was. And he, he thought differently and saw things differently. And um, we pretty much just lived in, you know, lived in my garage for, you know, all of the years when my kids were young, when I wasn't, you know, when I wasn't taking care of them or I wasn't working, we were out there out there working on art, making, you know, making things. But um, yeah, the balance is tough early. You know, it's, it's kind of it, anyone who has kids can kind of attest to it. It, it. it gets, it's kind of a blur, you know, they're, they're young, they need a lot, you're working a lot, you know, and, and, and Martha and I were both young. So we were working, we had to work opposite schedules. You know, it was, it was, she was working during the day and I was working in restaurants at night. You know, I wouldn't start until 5 PM or 10 PM and get done at 3 AM or 6 AM because you know, childcare was so expensive that it was basically the equivalent of one person's income. So, you know, it, 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 or at least half. So it just, we had to work separate schedules to make it work. So I, I just remember, I remember not restaurant? sleeping. What was that? How long did you work in restaurants? For a long time. I worked in restaurants from when I was 16. Uh, well, actually 15, 14, 14. I started in my first restaurant when I was in Lake City. Um, working as a busser and then a little place that was horrible called the chickety cottage and then uh, when I went up to the cities I got a job right away at Perkins I was I was uh, waiting tables making great money um, and uh, cooking a little bit and then once Martha got pregnant uh, the kitchen manager had like just quit so they asked me if I had any interest in taking over the kitchen I took over the kitchen and just started to do that uh, for two years. And then I got uh, offered a job at the air, the local airport to open up three restaurants out there with a group of people. Um, and then I, I did that and then went to the casino and worked at an Asian restaurant. And I'm so I, I would say probably from when I was four, 15 to 32, maybe so 15, 17 years or so. Yep. So, uh, you know, during this period, um, when you left college, art school, yeah. got married, started raising a family, working in restaurants, uh, were you doing any art at all or just I, put that on the back burner? No, I was super prolific, actually. I don't, I'm not quite sure how, um, but a lot of it I trip to, tribute to my buddy, Chris Laddick, you know, like I said, because he was, if I was at work, he was living in my garage, practically. He had an apartment, but he was never there. He was sleeping on my couch or living in my garage and working on stuff. Um, but we were working on 
a lot different work. And I, it's interesting, you know, in retrospect, I don't know what we were working on it for other than we just, we had to create, you know, I didn't, we were, we were making gallery worthy art, I think, without the intention of ever showing it, you know, it, like at one point I turned my whole garage into a gallery and we did an exhibition out there and had, you know, friends, family, we did like little advertisements in the local papers and stuff like that. And that was a lot of fun, but that's ever all it amounted to. We were doing, you know, these four foot by four foot, huge three-dimensional pieces that protruded from the wall on boards and just made out of anything we could pull out of a trash can, you know, bike parts and old tile. And, and it, it was, it was a lot of fun. And we were, you know, there were, there were no rules. There were no limits. It was, you know, just trying to best the other person, make something, you know, make something that the other person thought was amazing, you know? So it was just a wonderful camaraderie that, that, that went on. So, yeah, we were, we were, we were super active. There was a period of time where we weren't, but um, for the most of it, we were, we were pretty active. Uh, what was your reasoning in uh, not pursuing uh, gallery representation? Um, I, for, well, for multiple reasons, I think, I mean, I initially, well, I still to this day, it's like, it's overwhelming to me. I don't, I don't, you know, it's hard to explain other than that, but it's, the idea of, I, I don't know where to start first and foremost. And then second, once I think about, okay, well, if I did know how to start, I, the, the money thing's a huge issue for me. I mean, even when like I've, I've had throughout the years, I've had a multitude of people ask, you know, commission me to do works or try to commission me to do works. And ultimately it always doesn't end, you know, I, I don't end up taking the money. I don't end up, you know, doing the work. Uh, because it puts a restraint on the way my mind works. I wish it didn't do it, but it does. And it it puts, like, I feel obligated and I feel pressure to complete something within a time frame. And every time I've tried to do that, uh, it's a, it's just an epic fail. You know, I can't, I can't get to that end point, that completion of the artwork and, you know, to make money in the art world, there's got to, there's got, you've got to be able to hit those deadlines. You've got to be able to make I think, I don't know, I, you know like I said, I'm, I've never been involved in it. So this could all be stuff I've made up in my head that doesn't exist whatsoever. But um, that's been the main holdback is the idea of having to deal with money, which well, I've always had an issue with and, and uh, expectations uh, of. I'll call you later. I want to talk to you. Okay. So, so what's the driving force now with male art? Oh, the, just, just a simple joy. Like, you know, people get so, you know, I get, people get excited. It's, it's, I, I love, I love seeing the excitement. Um, it's very much so there's no expectations. There's no, I just, it's, it's all joyful. And, and well, and then a huge part is, you know, just my love for artist stamps and my love for rubber stamps and things like that. I'm doing things that I love and that are inspiring to me. And then to see people get excited about it is absolutely contagious. And then to see this amazing, um, it's just constantly inspiring. You know, every, every, every envelope that I open has something that I'm inspired by and it has something on it that I'm inspired by. So it's very easy to stay motivated. It's very easy to stay um, ex excited. And, um, and then, you know, preserving, you know, a lot of what I do is, is about preserving this history, you know, the, the history of, of male art in, in some way, shape or form. And uh, that's incredibly important to me as well. Uh -huh. Well, in the, uh brief history of something uh it's composed of uh 200 stamp sheets that you did uh you know in a two-year period it's a little fanatical but uh <laughs> yeah so you know you not only started uh producing uh, uh art artist posted stamps or artist stamps uh but um uh, you started uh publishing the artist stamp review and uh um, you know, there was a lot of precedent in the past for like a central newsletter uh, or publication linking, you know, the various worlds of artists, postage stamp producers and everything like artist stamp news um, by Anna Banana and then Ed Varney in the 80s and 90s. Uh, so this is the first real, you know, uh, publication linking you know, producers in this field. Uh, and uh, I just wondered how you began it and how it's developed. For sure. So um, 
you know, all the ones that you named were in, certainly inspirations. And then Clemente, I'm, I'm going to butcher names, but Clemente Padden had that zine that he did as well with individual stamps. I can't remember what it was called right offhand. Um, yes. but I, I think it was Southern Cross or something. Yeah, like that. Some, yeah something like or that. Southern, Southern Post, I think. Yeah, was. that sounds right. Um, you know, so I'd seen all of these things, many of which were introduced by you of all of these, you know, ways of ways of preserving and, and, and you know artist stamps and the history of it and everything like that but you know once i when i looked at that medium i saw a lot of people doing really amazing things and it wasn't being documented i feel like i felt like it was being lost and i didn't see anything currently happening that was documenting that that work which which like i said I, is, is incredibly important to me i feel like it, it has to be i mean otherwise it's just lost and 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 it's it's too important to just be lost so i i really felt it was necessary to take it upon myself to do something i you know early on when i started the artist stamp review i had no idea how i was going to do it i just knew i had to start something so it started pretty raw in that i was just photocopying artist stamp sheets that were sent to me um, and, and, and putting those together and binding them up and sending them out to everyone who participated. Um, but that quickly with how coupled with how active I became unintentionally, like it's it kind of just, I, I started, I started doing a lot more, um, that, that work of photocopying, printing, everything became pretty daunting. So I quickly turned it to an assembly zine where people sent me there were 20 copies and then I would put that together, which is still an immense amount of work, but it's, it's, it's much more manageable than I think it is. That was my suggestion. I think it was too. Yep. Yep. Um, and it's, you know, and then people start, you know, it started off slow, you know, people would send me some stuff, you know, the first handful of issues had 10, 11, 12 artists in them. Um, and it's, 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 you know, we just, I just finished up issue 25. I have 26 that I'm working on right now. Um, I roughly, you know, basically bound over 300, 300 sheets of artist stamps now. Um, so that's, you know, I, I take an immense amount of pride in that those are preserved in these issues now. Um, I know he hasn't sent in a while, but Cracker Jack Kid, I know he was involved in a lot of them and a whole bunch of those went to an archive recently, a bunch of the early issues did. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of at a point now where I have to decide whether I want to keep on doing it the way that I'm doing it or I need to make it larger. You know, I'm doing, still doing 20, you know, 20 copies is how many are made. Usually each issue contains like, like 18, 19 artists now, but uh, the submissions are coming in at a wild pace, which is amazing. But I think I might have to up it here soon to maybe 30 copies um, so that I can include more. And, um, you know, I like, I you know, right now everybody who participates gets a copy, um, but there's none left over. And I would like a few more left over so I can send it to people who aren't involved so I can, you know, get the word out a little bit more because that's the only fault that I see in the project. I think the project is amazing. I'm super proud of it. But the fault in it is that it doesn't expand far enough, in my opinion, beyond the people who are involved in it. You know, I, I, I take pictures and post it online so that people can see what's going on. But the physical copies stay contained within basically the people that are participating um, and I don't know if there's any way to get around that, but aside from making well, there, an amount of more copies, which, you know, I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, that's what you could do. Just raise it from 25 to 30. And then yep. you have five issues that you could set aside, you know, for each issue and everything. And yeah, because it's important, I think, to have back issues available. So you have a complete record and everything. You know, mail art, it's about the process. It's not the product. You know, we don't like to discuss who's a better artist or a better artwork, uh, but I'm sure there's certain people that uh, inspire you within the field. So maybe you just talk about a couple of people in the artist post stamp field that, you know, you've drawn inspiration from uh, besides myself. Of, of course. course, of course, of course. <laughs> um, that's a, that's, uh, let me backtrack for a second. I mean, I don't want to like get like super controversial here, you know, I don't know, whatever, but um, you, 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 what you just said is something that interests me. I, I recently got into kind of an argument with another male artist in that in that sense of, you know, pedestalizing male artists, pedestalizing uh, 
one artist as opposed to another. And it was in regards to, you know, one thing that I really enjoy working on is I work, I enjoy working on like homage stamps or I do projects just solely in homage. You know, I, like I, you know, did a, a sheet of stamps that just are, you know, were called HR Fricker rocks, you know, in a, in a tongue in cheek, you know, because he makes rock, you know, like um, just, uh, you know, I've, I've done, it, I've done it for a lot of people. And I, I think, Buzz the, Blur. It, well, yeah, Buzz Blur, you know, and I, yeah, I enjoy it. And they were very critical of putting these other artists on a pedestal. And that's an interesting concept to me because I think that it's, you know, it's interesting that male art is so specific and not wanting to distinguish the two. And I get it because it's, you know, that brings it closer to a uh, mainstream art, you know, to a, to a, to a galleries type, you know, high, high end art. I think if you start to, you know, pedestalize, I, I, I get the separation, but is it, I, I, it's human nature, isn't it? You know, you're drawn to specific things for a reason. It's because right. in your mind, it's better than something else that you've seen, or it's more appealing, or it's more, you know, appeals to you in a different way, which, you know, in hand in hand goes with in your mind, it's better. So I, I don't, I don't think it's taking away from something else necessarily. I think it's, it's human nature. You're, you're going to be more drawn to certain things than you are others. I don't know. I don't even know where I'm going with this. I just think it's an interesting conversation. And I think that the separation and the and the issues that male artists have with saying something is good, something is you know is is fascinating to me. But yeah. back to well, back. The, now the the reason for it though, if I could interject, please, it is to keep the system open. That is the primary function of male art to keep the system going, the eternal network, you know, portion of it. So when you're dicking around you know saying this person is better than that person you know it, it makes people not want to get involved because they For don't sure. think they're good enough you know let not... me let me ask you a question then john so what what are your sentiments on like an homage stamp then does that not because i could see her argument i mean i i like me doing a, a homage stamp of somebody does kind of you know without saying it says okay i think this person may be better than somebody else and that not that that's what i'm saying but it, it insinuates it i think so what are, what are your opinions on artwork such as that you know such as the like the ray johnson homage stamps you know all of all, things like that uh -huh. um yeah i don't think it's you know wrong to single people out that you know have had some influence on you or you know this or that um just you know you just need to keep an open mind uh, uh about you know the rest of the context and everything it, you know I, I get in trouble about this you know more than anybody quite frankly because i write history and, and when you write history you're setting up a hierarchy you know and, and people in, in male art have been against histories for a year uh as a matter of fact, there was a, a review in um, Art Forum once about about the male art book by Mike Crane. And the headline was a quaint art form that excused itself from history. You know, so that that was the thought of male art in the in the 80s, you know, um, that you wanted to be separated, you know, from the art world and uh, you know, all this stuff. It, it's very complicated because, uh, you know, I do think male art is a very valid, you know, uh, artistic medium. Um, it hasn't been recognized as such to my satisfaction yet, uh, but I think it's important in an art historical canon. I think it's an avant-garde art. Maybe it's the last avant-garde art of the, of the 19th century, 20th century. But then again, it's a people's art, too, you know. But this is what happens to avant-garde art forms, you know. You go out, you're adventurous, you go out, see what's there, you go out to see what nobody else can see, but then you bring it back and, and, and make it a democratic thing. And, and that's what's happened to male art. It used to be avant-garde in the 50s, 60s, and maybe a little bit in the 70s. By the 80s, it became uh, a populist art medium, you know. Um, which is good because I, I like the involvement. And, and my thing is that male art is a community. Male art is kind of a utopian. Um, 
you know, th theorizing on a global level. I mean, that's what interests me. That's why I'm in mail art for the community, you know, uh, not so much the art making, quite frankly, yeah. you know, to me, it's all ephemera, you know, uh, something to stuff an envelope with. But the the main thing is the community. So I'm I'm wondering if you picked up on that same thing. Oh, very very much so. Yeah, I mean, and that's you know, a huge part of what I what I'm draw, drawn to is the is the community and 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 that and the and the like sub communities within the community. You know, you have the people who are doing the Fluxus inspired stuff. You have the people who who are doing the artist stamps. You have the zine makers. You have you know the collagists. You have you have all these subcultures that are within this main culture main, main culture of of you know mail art um so it's it's kind of a whatever you're in the mood for whatever you're drawn to you know that that's what's amazing you can do any of it you know you can do any of it you can do all of it you can do one of it you can do none of it and still be involved in some way so it's it it's it's incredible and and and, and it's conducive in that way in that I, I do like to do everything so I'm drawn to these fluxes people when I'm working on my boxes. I'm drawn to you and these artist stamp makers when I'm doing artist stamps, well, or rubber stamps for that matter with you. Um, you know, there's it's there there is there is something on the menu for anybody, which is, you know, how what's not the love about that, you know, and then everybody's excited about it too. All right. Yeah, yeah. I've always thought the mail art was an umbrella. Yeah. For for a, a whole host of marginal, you know, mediums like yep. the artist stamp. The, but I, I want to get back uh, for one yeah. second to the uh, the artist stamp and it just name a, a few people that you, you know, for sure, for become, sure, you know, become fond of their work. Yeah, I mean, right off right off the bat, I would say Vittori Baroni was kind of one of the first because he was he was he's so active. Um, so I was drawn to him right off the bat. Um, a lot of the stuff that Sticker Dude has done, um, uh, HR Fricker, uh, Cracker Jack Kid, um. Uh, man, I mean, it's, it's so immense now. Um, Buzz, but yeah, of course, Buzz, uh, for sure, Buzz. Uh, his portraits now are, you know, continue to inspire me with my current projects. Um, you know, obviously Anna Banana and uh, the stuff she was doing is incredible. Gina Loda, um, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. She's doing, she did incredible work. I don't know if she's uh, still Jeannie Lloyd. Je Jeannie Lloyd, that's right. Sorry, um, a Jazz Felter. Uh, incredible work, you know. Carl uh, Chu, Carl Chu, Bug Post. Um, I you mean, know, it goes on. You know? It does. It's 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 it's, it's incredible. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, are you still are you uh, communicating with Bug Post? No, no, no. I've I, I've I've recently acquired a whole bunch of work though from Bug Post. Um, oh. I, I got I got uh, uh, Carl Chu recently had dispersed his collection of work and, and right. I got to him right away. And I, you know, I just sent him an email. that was like, Hey, you know, I would be happy to receive anything, but in particular, like I would love envelopes with artist stamps would be amazing. So he sent me uh, just this gold mine of, of just package was just all artist stamps of early, early work that he was doing with Higgins and uh -huh. early bug post stuff. And um, yeah, it was, it was incredible. And oh, it introduced me to a whole bunch of, artists that I actually wasn't familiar with whatsoever, you know, uh -huh. so it's been, it's been pretty amazing. Well, I, I sent you that French book, didn't I? Didn't you I sure? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah that, gorgeous. That, that was a good start to, uh, there was what was going on and everything. Yep. Uh, yeah. So, so you're a master now at the artist post and stamp thing. John, uh, maybe. I, I'd like to just touch on something that was mentioned earlier as a little aside. Is that all right? I won't. Uh, sure, go ahead. Um, the, the, the issue of money and mail art. And, you know, you talked about you didn't, you know, didn't want to sell your art for money. You weren't interested in it. And, uh, you know, something ran through my mind at the time that, you know, there's a tenant in mail art, uh, mail art and money don't mix for the, for the most part. And uh, we don't sell to each other. We don't pay except for costs where it's necessary. But uh, I wonder how much of a unifying theme that is for people to get into mail art like yourself. Because of the fact, you know, we don't want to 
engage or can't engage in the commercial art world. I mean, I think they're, I think they're then become artists, male artists, and uh, uh, one, you know, just sort of one feeds into the other, and it, and we, we establish our own kind of utopian culture without it, the exchange of money. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's probably a factor for a lot of people. I mean, I don't I personally don't have any issue with money being exchanged in Miller. I mean, I know it's kind of a I I have zero issue with it whatsoever. I mean, early on when I first first got started into mail art, and I was introduced to the International Union of Mail Artists. I think Mike Dickow introduced me to that. Um, I was doing projects specifically poking at money being exchanged with the with the hope of getting people riled up. I mean, I kind of like to be an instigator sometimes, but, you know, I was making all these postcards that just said, you know, um, uh, the, you know, this, you know, wh wh when you sell, you know, this will be worth a million dollars someday, or when you sell this, please send me 60 cents for the postage, you know, things like that. So I, I, I don't have any problem with it. I just choose, I would prefer not to because it, it, it messes with the way my creative mind works. So I, I like to keep it out. Uh, you know, I, I recently sold some 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 zines, you know, some artist books that I made to fund some projects, you know, so I don't it's going to happen. I'm going to probably continue to do it in the future from time to time to fund things. But you know, I got no issue with it. Yeah, if I can interject. Yeah, I mean, the, the main the main reason about mail art and money don't mix is, again, I come back to the openness of the system, because if you're nickel and diming your yeah. correspondence you know I, i've got 300 400 correspondents if each one of them wants a dollar or their yeah. return postage it's just not going to work no so it, the network is open to people that want to be in the network and you know expect to you know do this stuff on a generosity uh, yeah. basis a, a gift giving basis rather than a you know a consumer uh thing so i mean that's the main reason for uh mail art and money don't mix but if you're doing a special you know publication you know and you have to ask five dollars to cover your cost i mean i think people can understand that yeah. so i i mean it, it's it's pretty easy to, to tell who's you know ripping off the network for their own gain and everything and uh yeah but but like I say, that's the main reason about the mail art and money uh, don't mix thing. Uh, uh, you know, it was brought up by Lon Spiegelman, you know, in the mid 80s, because um, I guess people were selling, you know, mail art that they received free from shows and things like that, you know, gotcha. or, or they were asking for, you know, uh, public uh, money for their publication. And I know like Anna Banana took great offense. Uh, yeah. to that you know she wouldn't be able to you know sell her stuff um uh, we talked about the artist stamps and then uh i mean you've got the whole array of rubber stamps uh, you know behind you and everything uh and uh now you've got this great project uh you know with the rubber stamp portraits so maybe you could uh so, well, there was one other question I wanted to yeah. uh, ask about the artist posted stamps, and then and then get into the rubber stamps for me. Yeah, but, uh, uh, for the artist stamps, um, in the very beginning, uh, you were just you know indicating perforations by you know dots, uh, and then you, you obtained a perforator. How did that acquisition that, come about? Yeah, so that that acquisition changed everything. It's it kind of it was it was yeah so. I was indicating them or I was using, they make like the, for sewing and yes, you know, it was like a, a, a little perforation wheel that had little, you know, and you just roll it. So I was doing perforations that way early on or using a sewing machine. I, I would pick up these how this hollowed copper that I would cut off and sand down. So, you know, and then use it as a needle and it would punch out the holes pretty well. Um, and so that, so that always worked kind of fun, but, uh, but what would have been, a couple of years ago now, I found a perforator that was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on eBay, and it was just sitting in a warehouse and had been up there for quite a long time. And I negotiated with the guy and was able to get it for a really good price. I just I had to find a way to pick it up. <laughs> so I uh, 
I got a hold of my neighbor who fortunately had a truck and, you know, just proposed, hey, you want to take a road trip with me? And we didn't have a lot of time. So we drove literally straight to Pittsburgh, uh, picked it up, slept one night and drove straight back. And we were able to get it home. And ever since then, uh, you know, it's 1894 uh, Rossback. Um, it's a beautiful machine, um, all intact. You know, every all the all, all the pins were perfect. It just didn't have the little catch on the bottom for the perforations. But I just built one of those out of wood, so that works. But um, that that opened the door. You know, that allowed me to you know make artist stamps that actually looked like artist stamps. Um, but on the same topic, actually, you know, about a year ago, there's a gentleman, um, Tom Colson, uh, Sea Ranch, Sea Ranch, California. That sounds right, Sea Ranch. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, yeah. Um, yeah, he does. Uh, he does a whole bunch of stuff, and I don't know if he's a machinist by trade or or what it is, but he makes incredible stamps and does all these incredible things. Nevertheless, he he made a set of yeah. You know, anybody who works with a, a, a Rossback knows that there's like these little bars in there that you you put in the machine, and wherever that bar is, that's gonna make the perforations on the page. And if you take it out, it's not gonna perforate right there. Um, Tom Coulson made me a set of active activation bars that ranged from you know like five millimeters all the way up to, you know, you know, large full size bars. So uh, ever since I got those, I've been able to do just wild shapes, real crazy precision stuff. And, and um, it's kind of opened the door for, you know, my archipelago Island series and, and, you know, people sending me stuff that just says, Hey, can you perforate this? And then, you know, thinking that I probably can't, and then I'm, I'm able to, you know, so it's, it's been fun to experiment with those as well. Yeah, I think that's really important to tell you the truth, uh, you know, playing with the perforations, which is something you could only do when you have a perforator. Like I have a perforator as well, you know, so it, it, it you begin experimenting and uh, instead of just the straight perforations, you know, to, uh, you know, border uh post exams you know i started doing cr crazy quilt yeah. you know patterns and now i'm doing kind of like blotter acid you know very thinly space work so yeah getting the that's why i raised the question of the perforator because we do a lot of interesting stuff uh, and and i think the work you're doing with those kind of unusual perforations pretty special stuff actually and, and something you should probably keep doing because awesome. not a lot of people do that like i know i don't i don't do that type of thing because i don't want to take the pins i, I don't want to take the bar uh, because it's so old like you say it's from 1894 mine's yeah. you know from the same era i don't want to and and i'm not as mechanical as you are so i don't want to you know futz around with the bars and all like that but you know you have the uh, ability to do some really interesting stuff uh tell me about the rubber stamps now so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, rubber stamps I got into because of, because of Joel um, and his company that he started up, you know, with, with Thomas Kerr and, um, you know, he found all of his original uh, metal, metal plates, the, the, the master plates. And, and we started reproducing those early on. It's been a handful of years now. Um, and it steamrolled into that, you know, we started up reproducing those and then I started just messing around. Well, actually I'm back, backtrack a little bit. I, I was, I was hand carving all of my stamps initially. Um, I was mm -hmm. doing a lot of hand carving. Um, I did a you know, portrait series of, you know, kids uh, that were just, I, I, I referred to them as, you know, just misfits. Um, and, um, and then some tech stamps and things like that. I was I did a whole series, you know, where I carved like a goose Cl Gustav Klimt painting. I carved, you know, um, just different paintings, different iconic paintings, and that was wonderful. But you know, it, with time, it, I quickly realized, you know, if I want to keep on doing these other things, this is so time consuming that I need to figure out how to do this in a different way. Um, so that I can still get these images, but it doesn't take me seven hours to carve this stamp, you know. Um, so that's where the rubber stamp making came in. And I'm, you know, started to create things on the computer that I could, you know, turn into rubber stamps that I could then reproduce, which was important to me because I wanted to, you know, I, I've, I saw all these stamps that, you know, were on envelopes that have been, you know, in circulation since the 80s, the, you know, and, and it, it inspired me to want to continue that tradition as well, where, you know, my stamps, you know, Joel stamps and everything would live past me, you know, would, would ideally create a life of its own. You know, I don't, there's nothing, there, I, I don't care about looking at a stamp 
and going, oh, okay, that was made by Adam Rosopoulos or whatnot. Like just the idea of seeing it on an envelope and knowing that I had some part in that history of making that image that's now going to be on all these on all these envelopes and all this art. Like that's what's important to me. Just just knowing that they're going to keep on keep on going and you know the credit. Who cares? Like you know because stamps aren't signs. You know they they become part they become part of that community. They become part of that umbrella. You know they're now that subculture underneath that umbrella, and that's that's so cool <laughs> you know like i'm seeing you know i'm getting sidetracked a little bit but i'm seeing these um brain cells right Oscar cohen making these brain cells and i was talking to sticker dude the other day and i'm like man like looking at that sheet nobody knows it but between stamps the stamps that i've made of your your you know we've re reproduced your old stamps and my new stuff there's 13 of our stamps on this one page like it was just incredible to see and um uh, no nobody knows that except for me and now joel because i told him and you you know but like who cares? Like it's just it's pretty cool seeing that. It's exciting. It's motivating. But um, yeah. So I start. We started reproducing Joel's old stamps, and then I got into mention. You, you know that J C Casey really propelled us. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Actually, yeah, we started First using started making stamps uh, out of your carved stamps. We reproduced yep. them, and then we started making whole sheets with Casey. Yep, that's right. Yeah, we we I would scan all the ones that I'd hand carved, and uh, we put those on you know sheets that J C Casey out of New York was was making plates for us, and then we were reproducing those. And I I mean we ended up making a lot, I, like eighteen or something like that plates of Joel's old images and my current new ones, and just and I found the weirdness metal plates and stuff. Yep. yep, and we started reproducing those, and and then I and then I quickly found. Uh, I, I was super lucky. I was at a random antique store like two hours away and sitting like in the corner of their basement was a vulcanizer, foam cushion, all these old rubber stamps, um, old plates. Like it was literally a rubber stamp company sitting in the basement of this of this antique shop that, you know, they were selling because someone had, you know, didn't do it anymore. And I offered them a hundred bucks for everything. And they said, okay, just get it out of here. It's taking up too much space. So I got it all home. I set it all up, figured out how to use it. And, you know, and that was about a year and a half ago now. So, you know, the last year and a half, I've been able to essentially just have a rubber stamp company in my garage, which has been pretty cool. So, um, and then J J Sticker Dude and I recently worked on, you know, you're familiar with it, that Buzz Blur tribute book, which mm -hmm. showcases all the portraits that Buzz Blur had done you know, throughout his life, you know, during events and, you know, mail art gatherings and things like that. And um, it fascinated, fascinated me in so many ways, just, just how prolific he was with them. How, the fact that he was at all of these, you know, he was, he was there documenting all of these events and um, through portraiture, which I've always been incredibly fond of and drawn to. Um, so after that stopped, I couldn't stop, you know, after we were done with that project, I couldn't stop thinking about it. Like it was just constantly on my mind. And I got me thinking about how, how can I keep the tradition going? Buzz is getting older. Um, he's been doing it a long time. He doesn't, you know, I have at least for the time being an immense amount of energy <laughs> and I, you know, um, you know, how can I, how can I keep this tradition going? Because what he did was so important. And I felt similar to the way I did with the artist stamp review, like something, there was kind of a gap and it needed to be continued. I felt that same way about portraits in regards to documenting the current health of the mail art world, you know, what, what what's happening right now? We have all this amazing documentation of the 80s and the 90s because of Buzz Blur, because of many other people. But that documentation, the documentation is there. Like we, we know it. And I, I didn't feel like it was happening in the same way now. Um, so I don't quite know how I stumbled upon the 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 portraits I, there's I, are you familiar with this there's this company called peg pop peg pop rubber stamps i don't know if you're familiar with them but they, they came out with a whole bunch of box sets of rubber stamps that were like historic that one box would be historical figures another would be artists you know you'd have monet you'd have george o'keefe you'd have Cezanne, and and they were these incredible portraits that were really different than portrait rubber stamps that were different than any other rubber stamps that had an immense amount of detail um just incredible and they were on these you know you'd mount up these little plastic pieces with this little plastic thing and you know they, they were incredible so um you know that was in the back of my mind too in regards to how i wanted to reproduce them and that i wanted them to be high quality i wanted them to, to be really 
different than what other people were seeing. Um, so I started the rubber portrait project uh, at the beginning of this year, and uh, I've made 99 rub actual rubber stamps so far of artists and sent them out. And I have currently about another 80 or 90 to make. Um, and my hope is my hope is that they keep on coming in. Um, I'm I I really, really want this to be a true litmus test to a to a degree of of active male artists right now. And people who may, you know, like Anna Kloss, like she's not necessarily super active, I don't think, in exchanging mail, but she's putting together shows. She's, you know, I want to this project to embody anybody who has any degree of a finger in this world, you know. There, you know, Andrew Brenza, you know, is doing these amazing books and these amazing things. I don't think he exchanges many with many people, but he's still involved. So I, I don't know. It's, it's just incredibly important to me that that this history now that I'm part of is is preserved for these other people that I feel are so important. You know, they're, they're providing they're, they're 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 providing so much to to this to this movement to this umbrella and. and I, I have the knowledge and the drive and the capability of doing something about this. So I, 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 I feel like it's my job to do that. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it, I need to document this because I can, and I'm willing to. So this is, you know, this is my way of doing that. Uh, are you keeping everything you get? I mean, um, um, you know, saving the, all the mail that comes in and uh, if so, in what way are you? storing it maintaining it yeah so i save i save everything um you know currently i separate everything into categories some pretty simple categories you know I, I separate all the artist stamps i separate all the postcards i separate all the zines and then all the envelopes and the remaining context con contents go into a, a you know a, a file box i mm. scan all of the artist stamps and the other ones just stay stored and organized. The postcards do the zines. I have an area that I just store everything and I try to keep everything organized by who made them. Um, but the most important ones to me currently are the artist stamps and that's, you know, my long-term goal in the next five years is to start up a website that is, is my archive. And it will contain mm -hmm. visual images of absolutely everything that is currently in my archive. I want it to be seen by more. I want all of this work. It's so amazing to be seen by as many people as I can. And that seems to be the best way to do it. I mean, eventually wonderful if it goes into, uh, you know, the basement of some museum, but no one's going to see it there. So it's, it, it, it needs to be accessible to the masses while I'm still on this planet. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's, that's the most important thing to me right now is to scan and document these in a way that everybody can see them and then also catalog them in a way that they can go into some institution at some point, because I would like them to go there as well as be visible. You know, I, I want both. I want to have my cake and eat it too. So that's, 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 you know, that's how I'll get there. So five years from now, I think I'll be able to legitimately launch a website that will be my archive of artists. Uh, well, digitizing is important. And, yep. and um, I mean that that's about the most important thing an institution could do that's received the mail art is to digitize their collection, you know, and have it available uh, globally, you know, rather than just people who step into that physical space of the institution and everything. So I mean, that's totally the way to go, I think. You know, the, it is immensely the, the, the time consuming. <laughs> Oh, oh, I'm sure, you know, and, and I, I, there's no way I could do that with my collection. I mean, it's, you know, my, my collection's all, all in boxes, yep. And, yep. you know, 500 boxes, you know, so. Well, and that's, you, you know, that's the thing, though. I mean, you know, it's how daunting of a tax, task would that be? Like, you know, I, I, I went into this with with the hope of trying to get this under control before it got out of control. You know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so I don't know. I'm on the verge. We'll see. I got to keep at it. But uh, I could yeah. I, I could never die. I mean, you've been at it for so long. How do, where do you start? You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, you're young enough where you, you should just be doing things now anyway. You know, That's not, true. Not really documenting. You, you could start documenting when you're in the 50s or 60s or something. <laughs> you know? Just keep going now. I'm going to wrap it up. I, I, okay. I, 
I think we've we've you know I've done enough here. Uh, I don't know if Joel has uh, any last questions or anything, but personally, I'd just like to thank you for you know uh, sharing uh, today and uh, allowing me to learn you know more about your work and everything. And I must say, I've added you to a long list of uh, people that I've interviewed. Awesome, Clement Green, Clement Greenberg. Have John you really? Cage. I didn't know. I didn't know you interviewed him. I'll have to. Yeah. Do you, I'll have to look for that one. He's he's fascinating to me. Yeah, that's a hard one to find. I think is it okay? Okay. Yeah, but uh, yeah, John Cage, you know Ray Johnson, blah blah blah. So you know, uh, very honored to add Adam to the list and everything. I, so I Joe, a, that's it for me. I have a question. Um, what? What future projects do you have in mind? You mentioned the archive, you know, you mentioned the port that you have futures um, that you're thinking of. I I mean not well, I mean I have I have I have a couple, you know, like you know, I mean it's I got I got this distract is not the right word by the portrait project. That's kind of just taken over. But um before that I had a couple larger projects in mind. One is um uh I want to I want to make a book of o, o, Owen Smith's work um, of his, of all of his fluxes stuff. And then Vittori Baroni and I had done a, an ongoing collaboration that was strange and wonderful for about a year and a half where we just, you know, we referred to it as a male art battle. And it just, it, you know, we would create art picking at the other person, making fun of them, you know, just joking around, you know, whether it was physical copies or, you know, stuff that we did digital. Um, we, it turned into making videos, really stupid videos of me hanging in a tree with a mask on of Vittori Baroni and him making super weird bird head poking at a ball that had my face. You know, it's just this wonderful weird weirdness. And it, it was, it was such a joyous time and so bizarre. And it, and it, and it, and it was so, it just naturally, it was so natural in the way that it, it progressed that, I, 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 I think it needs to be documented. So I, I have all the, I, it took me a long time to track everything down and, and get dates and everything like that. Cause it, it was spread out between so many different mediums and everything like that. So I have all of that. So that's probably the next project that I'll work on after this portrait one is figuring a way to document that project in a way that's cohesive to someone who wasn't actually, you know, doing it. Um, and so that'll be somewhat substantial. But other than that, just keep continuing on with, you know, the artist stamp review. And um, I get to, you know, something comes to me and I get distracted. So I, I, everything will get set aside next when the next idea comes. And then I'll go back to some of those. So I just, I like to, you know, mail art's very conducive to just letting me kind of live in the moment. So if that's, I'll just keep doing that. Cool. Thanks, Adam. John, Thanks, it's lady. been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. uh, a huge thank you. Like I said, you played such an integral role in, in getting me involved in this. So um, really a pleasure uh, to sit here and talk to you today.